So yeah, I mean, the PGA, right? Yeah. Or there is a DMI tool here. And the microphone is here, or you can grab this one. Okay, do what you like. Yeah, I think it's easier with this one. Yeah. Uh, or I don't know. Uh, what with slides, it's fine. Yeah. So, we have 40 minutes and five people. So I don't know uh, how. No, 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 no. Uh, it will be till seven. Till it's seven. okay, okay. With, with, uh, with Jan, but you know, we expect the people not to use the full time. So in the end, like, you know, if we're going to have some people use the full time, the deck goes on. Maybe someone will, uh, won't show up, etc. Right? So it's no waiting for anyone. Like, oh. for some reason. So no, it's VJ, is it? Okay. Okay, so we can start. So I think we can start. Uh, okay, guys, so let's start uh, oh, our lightning talks. Uh, the format will be each speaker has up to 10 minutes, and then we exchange without a break, and uh, we'll be here until 7, right? It's 6 now. I don't know what time it is. So, yeah, <laughs> let's give our welcome to. Michael. So thank you. Uh, my talk is uh, seven Ansible tips and tricks in seven minutes. So about me, my name is Michael, but I don't have time to present myself. You can see all the other talk about it. So I guess that everybody knows what is Ansible. Please raise your hand if you do. Good, perfect. So I said that it will be a lightning talk, so it's packed with action and all kind of stuff. And the first trick is the action module um, that you can use with a variable called Ansible Package Manager, which is a nice trick, but it's deprecated with Ansible 2.0. And the way it works is that you can use that to install something on Debian, on Fedora, on the rel, because it's able to dynamically detect what kind of a package manager you want uh, using the setup and uh, the fact, and uh, create an action that depends on that variable, which means that you do not need to set specifically Yum or DNF. So that's how I make a portable Ansible playbook. So tips number two. Um, when people are using Ansible on the command line, you see that you need to give the group for the ad hoc command, and you have the group all. And it turns out that that group, well, you can use it for other stuff, for example, for a group variable. So if you have a variable that needs to be set for every possible um, every possible uh, server, you can use that. So this one is not a good, good tip because it's documented. But, 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 you can also use that group to get the list of all hosts on uh, your system, which is quite useful, for example, for um, monitoring. Uh, let's say that you want to declare an Agios server, you want to ping all the server, you can either get a second copy of the list, which is quite bad, because each time there is duplication, there is risk of error, or you can use that trick, which is just a loop, and when you add a new server, it gets added. When you remove a new server, it gets removed. So, quite easy. Um, tips number four, it's also a tips with a variable. It's a nice one. So, you get your, uh, you get your Nagios server, and you want to get the IP address of the remote system. How do you do that? Well, it turns out that you can use two stuff. The first one is a variable, well, an array called the hostvar, where you give the name of the server, which can be the name uh, given by the for loop from um, the previous tips. And then you can use a nifty uh, stuff, which is ansible underscore default underscore IPv4. So we get uh, the default IPv4 for ansible, which is kind of equivalent to the public IP address. And Ansible does that magically. If you get two IP, one of them will be uh, the good one. And that prevents to do complicated stuff like I do with other uh, tools. Um, so the fifth tips is more complicated. I think that a lot of people here are using uh, CentOS or well. And you may have seen that uh, CentOS was out two weeks after well 7.2. And uh, for well 7.2, systemd got changed. And I wanted to use uh, journalD and uh, the export feature, but it was only on 7.2 or Fedora or newer distribution and not the, on the old one. So in an ideal world, I used, should just say, okay, for well 
a version superior to 7.2, let's use that. But you cannot do that with Ansible. You can only give IP address or this kind of stuff. And it turned out that uh, using group by and a specific um, uh, Jinja expression, you can just uh, test for the major version, create a group, and then apply journal daily remote to that specific group. So you can filter on any kind of variable, create a group, and be done with it. And it's working. Now it's no longer a problem because all hosts are updated, but in the future, well, it will help. Um, so tips number six, that's my favorite, that Ansible by default works with SSH. That's fine, SSH is secure, everybody knows how to use it. But most people do not know that you can use for other stuff. So for example, you can use it with um, SSH root, you can use it with, um, what do I have? You can use it with Windows. And well, you can use it with Ghostfish. So you can connect to a ISO file, modify the ISO file, and write it. You can use it over Salt stack. So if you already have a Salt infrastructure, like I do have for the Gluster project, and if you want to just get rid of this, well, you can start to use Ansible over the bus. And because, well, it will not be a good uh, lightning talk if you didn't speak about Docker, you can also use it to connect directly to a Docker container and modify the inside of the container, which is a complete violation of the immutable principle, but I do not care. And uh, the last tip is, um, well, the last tip is not so impressive, but I didn't have time. It's basically that you are not forced to declare everything uh, directly. You can add your own uh, host. Like, I can decide to make a playbook that connects to a remote host that I will not manage, but I can still add the host and make sure that Ansible connect to it using delegate to and remote user, and I don't know if people can read from that, uh, that you can use uh, add host uh, module, and that's it. If you have a question, well, it's a lightning talk, so wait for me outside, and if you want to contact me, see the same stuff, my email, my IRC, no Twitter, no Facebook, no LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you. That was very fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very lightning. Okay, next one is Jakub or Alexander if he showed up. Okay, then Tomasz. <laughs> <laughs> then we may have to repeat this like three times, both of you guys. Okay, hello, my name is Tomáš Kukral and I work at the uh, ICT department at Czech Technical University and my lightning talk is called Fun with Kubernetes. Uh, sorry. Uh, how we get to the Kubernetes? We have the prehistoric era, which we are using uh, bare metal machines and deploying virtual machines manually and this horrible stuff. Then we discovered that we m need more virtual machines and deploy them faster. So we, we started to use uh, Open Nebula. And then we decided that uh, we don't love our virtual machines. We just want to throw them away and use a different one. And now we are playing with containers and uh, Kubernetes. Uh, our deployment is very smart. We have just two Kubernetes nodes and one master and a few running apps. I think it's two or three apps currently. And, but uh, the deployment is uh, backed by the Ceph storage, and the Ceph storage is running on seven servers, uh, which means that we need uh, 10 servers to run our small deployment of Kubernetes. Uh, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, the map of our, our network. Uh, you can see here that the, we have the two physical nodes. It's, they are called uh, i1 and i2. And the uh, iMaster is a virtual machine, and it's running the uh, controlling components of Kubernetes. Uh, every component of Kubernetes is, uh, runs in a container, except the kubelet, but I will talk about it later. And uh, we are using Ceph storage for persistent data. 
and the bird hurting daemon, it's running OSPF and, and uh, distributing routes to other servers. But uh, the image gets a little more complicated when we started to think about the uh, uh, high availability and the uh, fault tolerance. You can see that the, it, there is uh, I1 and I2, but there are so many links and so many switches, and uh, the image is inverted. So everything which is uh, yellow is red, and it means that we are missing it. It's not, it's not done this way. Uh, the um, uh, most important thing we, uh, we need in Kubernetes is uh, persistent storage. Because as one uh, OpenShift uh, developer called us, we are the crazy guys running MySQL databases in containers. Uh, and from my point of view, NFS and iSCSI really sucks because it's uh, center point of fire and the uh, huge bottleneck and if any uh, if this server goes down then your whole storage is down so we are using Ceph as i said before and we are using a rbd plugin in kubernetes but uh, it's not as easy as it may looks because uh, developers run just one proxy it's usually nginx the application and database but when i try to deploy it in kubernetes I have to put a QProxy behind this behind these three containers, but it uh, in the production it, uh, it has many many problems because the app container knows uh, uh, get static assets, and I need to move this static assets from app container to proxy container. There are some uh, CSS files and stuff like this, so I need another shared there, which is uh, used uh, empty their plugin. And I need uh, this uh, this hook with, uh, called uh, exec command, with, which uh, is used for cop copying the shared assets from app to proxy. There is a shared there which is mounted in proxy as well as an app. So just one container with app get I think five containers in Kubernetes before uh, after deploying. And there are sorry. There are, because we are running databases in containers, we need to uh, backup them sometimes. And we are using Bakula. And it makes even more difficult, because uh, in every pod must be running uh, Bakula file daemon. And this file daemon must be able to communicate with the Bakula master. And it make it even better, uh, even worse. It used two connections in both ways. So I have one crazy, crazy dream that I would like to use backup in a stream way. It's the same way as we are using for streaming Docker logs or streaming uh, uh, Kubernetes logs, that I would like to use MySQL dump and put it somewhere in dev backup stream or something like this. And I don't, I don't want to care because uh, backlog container has Sorry, uh, it's, uh, then it's necessary to configure it and the, to take care of the networking. And when I was preparing the presentation, they, that I get really, I think, a really crazy idea that I can use my favorite MySQL dump and put it into the s standard output, which means that this MySQL dump will be saved in Kubernetes logs. And it's kind of backup, and I can recover it later. But I didn't try it. Maybe if you have, if you have tried, you can you can tell me whether it's worked or not. And we sometimes need monitor servers because if it's not running, that uh, you know. And uh, our current status of monitoring is not very 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 good because we are monitoring just physical servers, where they are they are good in a good condition, and we are monitoring only the Kubernetes status, because uh, it's not very easy to to go into the Kubernetes and monitor each class, each pod, and the container. We are using rock solid solution based on Nagios and Observium, but it's not as easy as I I would like to 
the reconfigure this rock solid because you cannot move rock very fast. So our current solution is not able to make uh, changes in monitoring in seconds because pods go down and up. So uh, we are not, we are currently not monitoring the pods itself. Sorry. And another favorite thing is ATCD. If you have, uh, have ever tried to run ATCD, that uh, you know that's not very easy to monitor it. There is so many metrics, and uh, it's not just up and down, and uh, Nagios wants free statuses. Okay, warning and critical. And ATCD has so many statuses that I currently didn't write the whole sc uh, script to monitor all the metrics. Sorry? It's all. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions and we have time, I can I can try to answer it now or just catch me outside and we can talk about the Kubernetes later. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas. And next, I think it's 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 Uh Do you have slides? Yes. You have slides, right? Okay. And Alexander, did you show up? Are you here? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, so today morning, I gave a, a deep dive workshop on the topic uh, comparing the different orchestrations tool uh, for containers. Uh, so this is the slide of the GitHub page which I have used for uh, the workshop today. You can just uh, go back and uh, try if you want to dig more into. Uh, so uh, running containers on a single machine is not something what uh, is mean they are meant for. So you need to run containers in a production where you have uh, multiple uh, machines uh, working in a cluster. And then uh, you should be able to deploy your containers in production uh, with uh, features like uh, replication, uh, rolling updates, um, and all those features, which you need uh, in the real cluster or production environment. Uh, so that's where uh, containers are going to be uh, deployed or the real use cases will be there. So uh, why we need them? Uh, uh, because uh, first of all, we, we kind of uh, get rid of, of all our kettles. We want to move to all the pets so that if some application is very complex, you want to make sure that it becomes very easy. And you should be able to uh, um, deploy them uh, and uh, very easily rather than waiting for some complex operation to happen. We want zero, zero, zero downtime, we want auto scaling, and we want eventually reach to a place where we can have multiple cloud providers and we are managing all of that from one command line. So there are different tools already available which are kind of uh, helping out to do the orchestration. Uh, Swarm, uh, Kubernetes, Mesos, Diego, Apache Aurora, Amazon ECS, uh, Azure Container Service. So they can all help you out to move your containers uh, in a cluster environment. So just want to briefly go around, go about that, uh, what we needed to have those uh, uh, orchestration uh, to be done. So basically, uh, uh, we need, uh, first of all, multiple nodes to be part of cluster. So as we know that any, any whenever you want to deploy a cluster, uh, you need definitely multiple nodes. There would be, some of them would be a master, uh, some of them would be uh, uh, the slaves or the 
or the minions, what you call them. So master can uh, basically go and say, okay, now deploy some containers on some uh, some some nodes and all that. We come to uh, more detail in that. Uh, so you need uh, some way to identify that uh, in a cluster environment, which is master, which is slave. So you need some kind of mechanism to handle that. Like in Docker Swarm, you have uh, a token. So with that token, you create the cluster, and uh, in that cluster, once you create the cluster, then they become part of the cluster. So basically, in the same environment, you can have multiple uh, Swarm cluster, but they will be identified with different token ID. In Kubernetes, you have master and slaves. Uh, then we need a container engine to run on each one of the nodes which is going to host your applications. So we have Docker Rocket that is going to host your, uh, uh, run your containers on that, on top of that. Then you need a single source of truth about configuration and other details for the cluster. So it's like if you are if you are saying that I want to run five replicas of my uh, of my of my application, then there should be five of them. There should not be either four, either three or or less. So 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 you need some kind of uh, key value pair mechanism through which everybody can refer and say that okay, okay is am I the right what am I the right uh, configuration what I want to be. So, so the key value pair helps you out with that and other uh, other for other users also. So you have uh, etcd console, uh, those kind of tools which is being available for you to uh, manage that uh, single source of truth. Then uh, when you try to move to the containers with multiple machines, you would want container from one machine to talk to the container on the other machine in the node. So for that you need to have some kind of overall network or some kind of uh, uh, way to basically reach to one container to another point. So how do you do, do that? So it's like there are VXLAN, uh, there are different networking plugins from uh, Docker. Uh, uh, so Docker have a lib network, then you have Weave, Calio, there are different solutions which have been built uh, through which you can uh, solve that problem. Uh, then you have uh, a scheduler to schedule the containers on the node. So basically you would like to have some kind of a scheduler which would define that how my nodes, how my container is going to be deployed on particular nodes. So for example, you can say that uh, uh, put this particular pod application on the node which has SSDs. So you need some kind of uh, mechanism to identify that. So scheduler would help you out uh, in figuring that out that if you have put some kind of a constraint there that uh, should be able to uh, handle that. Then once you have uh, prepared your application, now containers are mortals. So container can come and go any point of time. So now let's say you're running container earlier on machine one, container dies, and it comes back on machine two. But your application should not be worrying, or the client which is accessing that particular application should not be worried about that. So, so there should be a service discovery uh, mechanism through which uh, uh, a cluster should know that how I'm going to uh, change my path, or basically the correct path to the correct container which came on different node. Then you need some kind of a, a proxy or HA proxy mechanism sitting on top of your cluster. So let's say you are, an, you are a client, you just want to connect to one endpoint and in the back end you would, might be running five containers, you might move to hundreds of them. So whatever would happen, client should not be aware of that. Client should be just accessing the one endpoint and they should be able to do that. And uh, once you have that, then you would also want to have some kind of shared storage. So for example, uh, uh, if your container moves from one machine to another machine, and if it's writing some data uh, on the disk, then the same data should be available on the other machine. So that, uh, that should be able to, no, there should be no interruption in the uh, in writing, as well as the data should be there, what you have been writing there. So what, you have some kind of shared volume, like ClusterFS, Ceph, uh, a Flocker, there are different plugins which will help you out to uh, do this kind of uh, shared volume mount on both the nodes in the cluster. And once container moves from one node to another node, the data is already there because of a shared storage. Now these are kind of broad features what we need uh, in the different uh, scheduling or different orchestration mechanism what are already available. So now just quickly see what the difference between them uh, in uh, Kubernetes, Swarm and uh, at Mesos. So we'll just go and quickly just look at them. So Swarm uses, uh, first of all, um, uh, multiple nodes is a common thing. Uh, Swarm uses token ID to identify the cluster. 
currently is just as a docker as an engine to uh, engine available to run the uh, run the containers uh, swarm has different uh, uh, key value pair uh, plugins so basically you can say i want to etcd console uh, zookeeper bold db whatever you want to use you can just do plug and play with that uh, that's available with uh, docker swarm uh, there are there's a lib network which would give you different drivers uh, but it also support different network pl plugins like Weave and Calico. So that's uh, supported in uh, Swarm. And for the scheduling part, uh, you have a uh, couple of uh, filters, filters and strategies what you can follow, like uh, nodes. You can have some node filter. You can have some uh, 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 filters based on uh, Node, uh, filter based on containers, like I want to run this container only when my DB is running on this node, something like that. You can have the container in different strategies, like you can say, spread my nodes, spread my containers across different machines, or you can say, just uh, uh, pick the one node and fill it first and then move to some, someone else. You can do a random. For search discovery, uh, uh, there is, uh, you can use uh, uh, something called interlock. Uh, which is there, for, which you have to have an extra one. Uh, basically, uh, Docker Swarm by default, as a, as a, as a final, they don't provide by default a internal DNS server or service, mechan service discovery mechanism other than putting the details uh, of the containers on the ETC host file. But there's work in progress through which uh, you can have uh, internal DNS uh, or the service, service uh, discovery mechanism like interlock there. Uh, so yeah, sorry, the interlock can also work as a HA proxy. So HA proxies, uh, uh, you need to have an HA proxy if you want to uh, do load balancing in uh, with Swarm. And there are plugins like ClusterFS, Rexray, Flocker, which you can use with Swarm. My username is nkare, N K H A R E. I'll just write it down somewhere. Can you help me out, someone? <laughs> I'm really sorry about this. I don't know. Backspace. I want to do a go back. Back. And we're running out of time, but uh, did Alexander or Jakob show up, or we can give? Uh, give more time here, so I just want to know. No, then that didn't show up. So we'll <laughs> we'll give you three more minutes to fight with GNOME. Yeah, GNOME, not me. Okay, uh, so for Kubernetes, uh, quickly we'll just finish off. Uh, Kubernetes has master and slaves. Uh, it can support uh, Docker right now, but uh, Rocket work is in progress. Uh, it currently has uh, uh, KVLU pair as uh, HCD. It can have Flannel, OpenV switch, Weave, Calico as a plugin for the networking. And uh, in the scheduler, uh, you would have predicates and priorities to decide where you want to run your nodes, uh, containers, as well as you can have some kind of, uh, like in OpenShift, we have uh, uh, different kind of uh, strategies like SSD strategy, so basically put this particular container on a machine which has SSDs, different zone and all that. Uh, then you have uh, inbuilt uh, uh, clustered uh, DNS server, which is, so you can have an add-on in, uh, in the Kubernetes, which can help you out with service discovery. Uh, and then HA proxy is built in with, uh, uh, with Kubernetes. You have different volume support with Kubernetes. Uh, and there's a presentation which you want to kind of Go and look back. I want to go one more time.
So this is an uh, architecture for Mesos. I'm just going to skip that for time being. So with, okay, out of time, okay. So you can just go and look at this up. So yeah, GitHub slash NKHARE. Uh, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks everybody for listening and for participating. Uh, please do rate the lightning talks and talks and uh, we hope to see you here tomorrow. That's it for today.